This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show, Ronaldo Marcus Green. How you doing, Ronaldo? Good. Thank you for having me, man. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. I really do appreciate it, man. I absolutely loved King Richard. I saw it over the holidays with my family, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not uh, King Richard with my daughters. Thank God. <laughs> but the man had, his, man had a vision, and we'll get into it uh, in a little bit. But first, man, how did you get started in this insanity that is the film industry? <laughs> Uh, you know, I have a brother, Rashad Ernesto Green, that, uh, you know, he first became an actor and, you know, started, you know, doing the whole traveling the world, doing theater. And, and I was following him. And then he decided to go to NYU graduate film school. And I remember seeing him start as a as a young director. And I was working, you know, as a teacher and then went to Wall Street for a few years while my brother was becoming this burgeoning filmmaker and, you know, sort of sharing, sharing stories from, from, and, and look, I had no interest at the time. I just had a brother that was doing it and was becoming successful doing it. And we, we were really close. And I thought, you know, what if, what if we did it together? What if we became the green brother somehow? I don't really even know what that means, but like, maybe I should apply to film school and, and I can learn to produce movies. You know, I could, I could help my brother, make his films you know that was really the first um you know thought when i decided to go to film school and, and that's exactly it i wanted to produce i wanted to write and and i applied to nyu left my my desk job at aig uh to uh yeah. to pursue this crazy wild journey uh, of filmmaking and um of course look nyu is a writing directing program so sure. although i was producing as a, as a focus you know, you have to write and direct. And some of my short films, uh, you know, started to take off uh, as a writer director. And it, and it opened up this opportunity for me to direct. And what lineman, if, you know, to use the sports analogy, if you give a lineman the ball and he can throw it, like, who doesn't want to do that? That's pretty <laughs> cool. I've been blocking my whole life, but I'm the big guy that could run? Like, yeah. Oh, I'll, man. I'll, I got to tell you, yeah. anytime a lineman gets the ball, it is the best entertainment you can watch <laughs> that was me. i was i was the guard or i'm the pulling guard and the, you give me the ball i'm taking it i'm pick six i'll do anything to oh, get the ball dude when you and see when you see them stumbling the when you see them stumbling down the <laughs> they're just running waddling, me just waddling down <laughs> shaking my big belly and like uh, just loving the, it just the, loving the, every minute of being big and brutal and and so, that's what it felt like. I felt like a lineman who got the opportunity to get behind and somehow threw the ball and connected. And, and, and that's how it started awesome. for me. I, I really, it, it started with a, with, a, with a hair of luck and then realizing like, okay, if I really work at this thing, if I work at this and I, and I really pursue it, mm -hmm. you know, I might, there might be a path. And, and, and that's the path I decided to take. So then you were actually in you were at in wall street working on wall street during the financial crisis at aig so literally that's i'm sure there's a script somewhere that you have not put out yet <laughs> like literally like so i worked in diversity and inclusion right okay so, so imagine that right aig brings down like the entire system but what do they do they cut the diversity department like as if it was our fault somehow that you know, the CDCs went sour. You, you, like, don't, you're like, you know, give me a break. But somehow I got very, you know, look, I was, I was savvy and I was just, you know, just trying to survive really. And, and I found another role within, you know, AIG. They, they changed the name of the company to Chartist sure. at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, I, I found some solace, you know, through some connections I made to, to, to find some work. And then AIG, of course, the stock came back. Sure. Everything came back and I, and I remained there. And, but then what I realized was like, look, they could pull the rug at any time. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and what I was doing felt when that happened, when I realized that diversity was the first thing that they were going to cut or one of the first things that they were going to cut, it, it made me realize like, oh, okay, like what my, my skills are better used somewhere else. Right. Uh, you know, this is it's more window dressing than it is believing in the mission. And it was probably the best thing that could have happened because it, it, it made me realize at a young age, like, OK, I have a lot more to give. I don't feel 
quite as passionate about this thing that I was giving everything to. Um, and I want to put it somewhere else. And, and then you, and, and then you decided to go into the lucrative business of being an independent filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. The $330,000 of debt. Oh, you. Yeah, that, oh, that's really, uh, that hurts, man. Probably not the wisest thing on paper. But in but my mind, it worked out. It's, it's, look, let's just be fair. It's worked out okay for you so far. Uh, you do, you did all right. You doing all right. You know, but all right. but but right. but when you walked in, but you when when you walked into that path, there was no signs going. You're going to be working with Mark Mark Wahlberg. You're going to be working with John Washington, John David Washington. You're going to be working with Will Smith. There was no like, no one whispered that in your ear. I'm like, just keep going. It's going to be all right. You were just like, I'm rolling the dice. I'm rolling the dice. And, and you know, I, I rolled the dice because I had a brother that proved that he can do it. He was being, he was, he was successful. Yeah. He, he, he paved the path. Look, there's no path to me becoming a filmmaker without him being a lead blocker. And I had someone that did the hard road, did the work and, and was, was making it was, was developing for HBO had made his first movie, which went to Sundance. He did everything right. And this is with no contacts, no nepotism, right, nobody right, right. in the industry, like literally put his head down and did the work. And I and I saw that there was a path. OK, if he can do it, you know, his baby. Bro- look, Peyton's already doing it. Eli, look, Eli's coming right behind you and we're going to win some championships. You know, <laughs> you know? And, and, and that was the mindset. Like, let me just let me get my foot in the door. And let me try to navigate, you know, and, and look, I'm, a, I'm the baby brother, right? So, mm. of course, it's easier for me to see what worked and didn't work. And I can collapse that time a little bit. Like, okay, it took four years for you to do that. I'm going to do it in two just because you saw the mistakes, I yeah. you know, and, and it, you know, I, I have, I have a lot to be grateful for, for having had a brother who had experienced the film festival circuit, had, had gone through the process of ups and downs. And 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 made me realize like okay if if you stay together you you find the right crew you have good ideas that there is a path towards success and you were uh, yeah, like you said who would have thought Mark and Will and all those other things were going to be part of that but but yeah you put it, your head down and things happen anything and it's possible. and that's why it's so important I think that we see ourselves represented in mass media because you were lucky enough to have a brother who saw it you know but before Spike. Before Robert Townsend, there weren't a lot of, you know, before Van Peebles, there weren't a lot of African-American directors to look into. Me, I'm a Latino. If it wasn't for Robert Rodriguez, I wouldn't even have thought that it was even possible. hundred you know, percent. You know, and when I saw Robert do it and I was just in high school, I was like, wait a minute, maybe I, there's a path for me in this. Yeah. There just wasn't anybody out there. So it's so important to see someone else. If you wouldn't have had a brother... Maybe this is not a conversation we're having today. It's absolutely not a conversation. I don't even. There's uh, for. There's no doubt. I'm probably back in education. Um, mm-hmm. I'm. I'm probably a superintendent of a of a, a school district in Newark or mm-hmm. Oakland. Mm-hmm. And 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 that was the path. I wanted to work with children. Mm-hmm. I wanted to you know rebuild school systems. My mother was a you know a Puerto Rican from South Bronx who was oh, a teacher yeah. in Newark. For, you know, for 30 years. So, you know, my dad was an attorney. You know, I, I, I wanted, th- that I, was the path. I thought there was some Boricua. I thought there was some Boricua there, man. I thought <laughs> yeah, I would, We, we was... have Puerto Rican, for sure. <laughs> I grew up, we, grew up, we grew up with a black father. We grew up in a single parent household. My mom was always in our lives, but, sure, but sure. we certainly, like, we lived with dad. And he was, he was the anchor. He was the home. He sure. was, you know, he was everything for us. And, and my mom wanted that. She really wanted us to grow up with a father. Too many, too many black men latino men didn't have fathers in their lives and my mom it was important for her right to to make sure and and so like i credit my mom for that decision because it's hard for a mother to say right. you know what i think it's it's, it's better for you, your lives you know to have your father right now you know and, and that's a big decision for, mm-hmm. for parents. and you know look we're we're, we're 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 fortunate for it you know my mom is in, in our lives and 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 and, re- and thankfully so but uh but yeah pops was really there holding it down man sure. i i i feel you 100 percent, man i was raised by a single mother and i i get i feel you man i feel you without <laughs> without question now what was the biggest lesson you think you pulled out of nyu besides maybe i spent too much on, on student loans <laughs> <laughs> biggest lesson you know 
I think, look, if I were if I were going to give any student advice, it's you really have to stay to your true north. There's going to be a lot of people telling you, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's too ambitious. It's too this. It's too that. Mm-hmm. And you just have to, you know, look, you have to listen to those things, but ignore them at the same time. Because if I had listened to every professor or my students, I, I wouldn't have made the short films that I made. You know, I, I would not have taken the path that I, I took. And, and, and it's not that you don't value what they're saying. They, they're, they're, they're telling you because they're trying to look out for you. They're scared. Well, yeah. And, and it's, it's one of those things where you just have to push through if you know that you're capable of doing it. Um, there's nothing wrong with failing. Um, there's nothing wrong with failing, especially in film school. You have to. You have to Pain. fail. You have to fail. You have to, and you and I made seven short films. A lot of them are on hard drives. You feel know, like no one knows what those are. <laughs> There's some some rough homework assignments, but you know what? It was it was part of the the growth of of finding your voice. Um, you know, I think when you're in school, you, you you're in some ways you're doing a lot of mimicking. That's what we do, right? We watch sure. the filmmakers, and you just you're yep. just copying until it becomes yours, and then you realize like, okay, there's only so much copying you can do. You know, and look, that's where every sketch comes from. That's where every art comes from. It truly is like we're always stealing. That's what we're doing constantly. But at some point you have to rest on your own ability to Mm -hmm. actually be able to form a vision. And that just takes time. It takes it takes failing a bunch to to find that voice. And that's the thing. It's about fine. I mean, I always tell filmmakers like you've got the, the thing that you have going for you is there's only one of you. And that is the juice, that juice that you have, that creative juice that you bring to the table. No one can steal that from you. Like I could try to be David Fincher. I could try to be Christopher Nolan. And, you know, we might get real close, but there's never going to be another David Fincher in the way he does it. So you can't that's and that's why a lot of filmmakers make that mistake they mimic so much they're like i'm gonna make a tarantino film jesus how many movies in the 90s were ripoffs of pulp fiction that were horrible like because Uh, no one can ever (laughs) mimic tarantino and and that's exactly and that's and look it takes it just takes time to find it because it's not the if you haven't done it how do you know what's your voice (laughs) you know it's just very tricky until you realize like oh that was me like my perspective, I'm half black, I'm half Puerto Rican. Like my first film, I got a Latino character. In the, like I, I, I just try to stay very true to the voices that I grew up with and knew. I knew that community. I knew what those homes looked like. I knew what that world looked like. And I knew the kinds of films that I wanted to make. Like anybody else, maybe they do a cutaway of the garbage on the street. Like, I don't care. That's not, I'm not, I'm not interested in poverty porn. I'm interested in telling a different part of our stories that haven't been told before. I'm in, I'm interested in showcasing us in a way that we haven't been lens before. You know, I'm interested in, in showing us as heroes, as giants. Um, I'm interested in our unsung stories. So I, I'm trying, and I try very much, like I don't want to see us in orange jumpsuits. Mm-hmm. I've seen too many of those stories before. Right. You know, I could have started my story anywhere. Coming out of prison. Look, how many stories do we, we come out of prison? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Let's start it right after. Let's just start it right after. I don't need to see him in the jumpsuit. We get it. Get it. We get it. I get it. And I think that's 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 the difference. It's like, okay, it's just finding those little things that make you uniquely you. And if you look at the body of work, people will say, oh, okay, it wasn't just one time or by accident. He's been doing this all along. Right. This has been part of the language. Yeah, exactly. And like I always tell people, like, you know, Martin Scorsese would have made a very interesting Jaws. Yeah. Uh, and Steven Spielberg might have been made a very interesting Goodfellas, yeah. but it's not going to be. It's because that's not their, that's not their lane. That's not their juice. That's not what they you know gets. You know, can you imagine if Martin Scorsese presents E. T. Like, how is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the aliens dying. Amazing, actually, someone is going to die. No, I would watch that. I would love to yeah. see. I would like to see Tarantino's E. T. Uh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like Gremlins on on you know. That's as close as you're going to get to Tarantino on E.T. is just watching Gremlins 2. Yeah. Not Gremlins 1. Gremlins 2, which is insane of a movie. It's an insanity of a movie and how that thing got made. Um, now, you got your first film. Uh, is it your first film got into Sundance, right? 
Yeah, so we, you know, we were fortunate to to get to Sundance with. with what Pop was that experience, man? What was that experience like as a as a filmmaker growing up in the '90s and and you come on, like I want to say I enjoyed it, but it was like the most painful week I ever had because, <laughs> you know, I'll never forget. Look, I I had you know I made the movie and getting into Sundance was an absolute dream. You know, I had been there with the short film and sure, to sure. get there with a the feature, I felt like I, you know, I felt like I I really had had done I had done it. In my mind, I remember the, 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 the reception to the film. In my mind, I saw people standing. I saw people crying. I remember people coming up to me after the film saying it moved me so much. So I was on this high, like, wow, we did it. People love it. And then the first review of the movie came out. <laughs> and I thought, my, I thought my life was over. <laughs> I was like, um, well, I guess... I should not have gone to NYU because I'm never going to be able to pay this off. <laughs> Literally, that's the only thing that went through my mind. You know, the review was like, he should essentially stop making movies and, um, you know, like, stop, Jesus. like to stop now and save us all, save the earth from this. Per and I was like, it felt personal. Oh, yeah. I felt attacked. I felt. And, and look, look, it was the most humbling thing that could have happened because. You know, up until that point, I had only made short films. It had only been praise. It had only been pat on the back. Good job, son. It had only been good. And, and, and in life, things just aren't that way. You're going to lose. You're going to face adversity. Things are going to be tough. And, like, it was just a, like, punch in the stomach. And I remember, like, I think Idris was, like, DJing the after party. <laughs> And I literally was like, and he was like one of my favorite. And I look, I had my backpack on, and I was just sulking like a like a like a like a like a baby, like sure. you had gotten beat. And uh, it was just, it was a horrible eight hours. It was like I, it was the oh. it was the worst eight hours of my life. And and look, thankfully, you know, the ne every other report after that was positive. And then we sold the movie. I mean, it was literally like the complete opposite. Then we won a. Uh, an outstanding award, a jury prize mm -hmm. for the movie. So like, it was like the like a 360 turnaround emotionally <laughs> for me in that week. But to say I enjoyed it was like, you know. But, but you know, no. but that's, look, that's the thing, man. Because uh, I mean, early on, even in my career, my, like my first short film, dude, I got so much praise, dude. Like, you know, it's like the Matrix meets Fight Club and like David Fincher Reborn. And I'm like, what is it? Like, and your ego starts to grow. It starts to grow. And then I had I had uh, I had like sixty reviews, just like dude, it's the second coming. Alex yeah. is the second coming. And then I had Roger Ebert review it, a short film. Roger Ebert, the great, the late great yeah. Roger Ebert, re reviews it, gives me a positive review. From that point on, the hater raid was massive. Everybody came after me, and yeah. it was just like this humbling experience. If you're like, oh, so I think George Clooney said it the best. It's like never believe. Uh, all, when they're saying you're really great, don't believe it. When they say this really bad, don't believe it. Just a hundred percent. And since that. that moment, it was the best thing that happened. I asked, you know, you know, you your distribution companies, they put you on, you get links to all the reviews. I, I asked to be taken off the distro list. I'm not on social media. It changed my life in the best way. I just, I wanted to make, I just wanted to focus on making good films and films that I feel complete about, films that I feel that I did everything in my power to, to, to do justice to them, to the subject matters or to the, to the people or the communities that I was reflecting. And that's it. Look, don't get me wrong. It's really great when you get the, the oh, awards sure, and, sure. And, tell you, and I find out, you know, I find out, you know, or they tell me, don't look at, you know, just don't look at that one, you know, like <laughs> skip the, uh, you know, but it, it, it's been great. It's been great because it, it truly, is now just about the work and, and not about, you know, who wrote, who said what and who said this. If you believe what in what you did, then there's going to be good. There's going to be bad. There's not 100 percent of people are going to love your stuff. So, no, I had George Lucas on the set and he had a T-shirt that had a bad review of Star Wars on it. It was like amazing. And anytime you feel bad after a bad review, just type in bad review Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. And, and you'll read it and you'll just laugh at like some – idiot writing a bad review about Shawshank Redemption or bad review yeah. Godfather. Like, it's just like, it's, you know, it, it just is what it is. You know, and I, and, and, and look, you need those people too. Yeah. And, and there's always something in it 
to be learned from. And and I, and I think, look, I take all the good with the bad, you know, you hopefully more good than bad, but, but certainly take, <laughs> take, take it all, soak it all in. You can learn from every experience. No film is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we just, you know, I, I'm very proud of that. And look, Monsters and Men completely opened the door for a lot of, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of even being able to be in the room for King Richard. So um, right, exactly. Which let's so bring me let's bring into King Richard. How did you get involved with King Richard? So when I first read the script, I hadn't even uh, I hadn't even shot Good Joe Bell at the time. Mm -hmm. and so I remember when I read it. I thought it was such a great script. Uh, Zach Balin, who wrote it, I thought it was a great script. But apparently at the time, the they didn't have the rights, the family rights. Right. And so my agency was like, look, we're not, we, you know, we're not support, we're not supporting this because the, fa the family's not on board yet. And so, you know, I said, look, okay, cool. Let me know if the family comes on board. I got the opportunity to direct Mark in a, in a, um, in a film uh, written by, you know, Larry, Larry McMurtry, the great mm -hmm. Larry McMurtry and Diana Osana, produced by, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal and mm -hmm. Carrie Fukunaga. I said, I, I got to jump on this. And then, of course, the day I'm flying to go make that movie, I get a call saying, hey, are you available for King Richard? Like, even to meet on King Richard. And I was like, no, uh, look, uh, just let me know if anything changes schedule wise. And, you know, yeah. just just, you know, I'm going to go shoot this movie and, and let me know. And sure enough. Sure enough, I don't know, they went through the director cycle or whatever they did and they pushed and I was just coming out of finishing my movie, uh, out of shooting the movie. I was in the final week of shooting and I landed a, uh, I landed a meeting, a virtual meeting with, uh, with Warner Brothers. And I pitched, uh, I pitched on that, uh, on King Richard. From there, I ended up meeting one of the producers of the project. I flew out to LA um, on Mark's plane. So that was cool, <laughs> you know, <laughs> came to LA for the weekend met the producer and then a week later i finished the shoot flew straight to la and then i met with will and that was the final step in the process uh, was was really meeting will so, so i gotta um, ask you man i actually i have because i've been in the, I've, I've been in those rooms with those kind of that caliber of star in the world man and what was it like walking in and meeting will smith man like you grew up you must have grown up with will obviously and you must have seen him as you were, like, well, what the it was like? crazy. Will wasn't the scariest for me. It was the two other dudes that were with them. You know, <laughs> as they should be, as they should be, as you know, they should. Like, so, if, if it were just like Will and I, maybe it would have just been fine. You know, but <laughs> I was like, there's two dudes here that are like not smiling, and they're sitting like on, you know, like literally right next to Will, and they're not saying anything. So they're bodyguards, like what, you know, one was James Lasseter, who mm -hmm. is Will's producing partner, sure, sure. long time business guy. Mm -hmm. You know, James is great, but like, he's scary. Like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't say much. He's just kind of listening. And so, you know, part of me was like playing the room a little bit, like who do I talk to? But then I was like, you know what? I can't worry about these two dudes over here. I'm gonna just focus on Will and, and, and see if we have a connection. The other guy was Caleb Pinkett Smith, who's Jada's brother. Um, and, and look, they were, they were great, but it was really about Will. It was really about Will. Will's his own man. Will has his own thoughts in mm -hmm. the, in that meeting, Corey Booker shows up and like <laughs> knocks on the door. It, like, I guess he was campaigning at the time. He must've been looking for a big check, but it was cool. And, uh, and he literally like did a FaceTime for my mom. Cause she taught in Newark. So he got on and FaceTime my mother. So here I am with my mom. Will Smith, Cory Booker, in my meeting with Will, it was just like, what's surreal? What's, happened? what's this is my life, and you flew it over on Mark real. Wahlberg's plane, on top of it. Yeah, all. I flew it on Mark's plane, <laughs> which was pretty, which was pretty epic. You know, look, I know who would have. The, the world is is crazy like that, but look, I think if I step out of it, I realize like, okay, I actually I did go to school. I, yeah. I did I did all the steps yeah, that man. you're supposed to do. So although it feels so insane, it, it actually like, oh, OK, like all these things are possible when you're in the NFL, so to speak. When you're playing at a certain level, it doesn't matter. Rookies are playing with veterans like that's how teams are built. That's how championships are built. And when I got in that room, that's what it felt like. It felt like, OK, Tom Brady is leaving New England to go to Tampa Bay and he's looking to win a championship. Like that's what I felt in that room. And here I am like, oh, okay. I have a player that really wants to do this. And now I have to assemble 
a cast around him. I have to, I, I saw it as a vid, like I, I saw it very clearly. I saw his intention for wanting to be a part of this movie was not like, oh, I'm doing 10 other things and this is just one. He cleared the slate for King Richard. And I, and I felt that in that meeting, I felt like it was a genuine connection to the material. And I felt like he was a dude from Philly who saw another dude from New York who was like, yeah, we know what this is. We understood how someone like, like Richard Williams could be misunderstood for being an outspoken black man. Mm -hmm. We understood how a black mother could go overlooked, you know, for the work and the, all the things that she was doing. I think innately we understood that story because we grew, we, it sure. was part of our own journeys. Sure, sure, sure. And, you know, Will being a father himself, I think obviously added a completely another dimension to his relationship with his daughters. His relationship with Willow, I think, was able to just completely help shape that father-daughter relationship. I don't think there's anything like it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think Will had his own engine when it, when it came to that. And I think he just... He pulled a lot from his own relationship with his own father. You know, Will's dad was military and militant, but clearly, you know, Will, Will was able to draw a lot from personal experience and 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 Richard's memoir to to form what we what we did. And then collectively, finding the right look, the right balance of prosthetics, the right balance of dialect, um, you know, so that we can so we can build you know our version of of, of what Richard was going to be in the film. So. You know, as directors, there's always that day, if not every day, but generally there's always that one day that the whole world's coming crashing down around you. Uh, you're losing the sun, you know, the actor breaks his leg, camera lens falls, like something happens. What was that day for you and how did you overcome it? Well, I'll tell you, it's the kitchen scene in the movie. Oh, yeah, I remember. Uh, you know, and in Orlando, like in, in Orlando, the Orlando kitchen scene. Yeah, the Orlando kitchen scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, what has ended up being one of the most talked about scenes in the movie was certainly one of the most challenging right. scenes to to create. It was a it was a challenging day because we had to shoot the exterior of the house early in the morning. We were supposed to shoot the kitchen scene in the first half of the day, and the second half of the day was the scene with Serena and Will, which was not originally intended to be in the location that you see in the film. It was written to be in the house. Mm -hmm. So all of that was supposed to happen in the house that day. Mm -hmm. So clearly I screwed that up. <laughs> I screwed up that scene. I left no time for that scene. But I think what was the best thing that happened is that we, you know, really the night before, I think that scene was just always the trickiest on paper. All right. the ideas were there. All of the ideas for the scene were there. The dialogue was there in, in, in certain form. But how you get to it, the blocking, the movement, you know, the staging, the motivation, how, how you kind of come to, was it indoor, outdoor? You know, how did, it was coming off of one scene into another scene, the fluidity of it, how the, how the argument builds was just always a real challenge when you're right, like the writer wrote it in a, it didn't write it in the space. He wrote it in his room, you know, mm -hmm. in a coffee shop. I don't mm -hmm. know where it's at. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you get the space, the challenge is now, how do you make that scene come to life? That's part of the directing of it. It's like, okay, I have all these ideas, but it's, it doesn't work for this space. And now we, we have to find it. We have to create a moment. And I think the actors were game. Luckily for me, we shot most of the film in chronological order. So they knew their characters by this point in the movie. And then it was really just finding out the levels. Okay, like what is underlining, what's the most un important part of this scene is that no matter what happens, no matter what's said here, that you guys love each other, that your daughters are first, that despite your disagreements, but despite the history here, that you guys will f find a, forge a path forward because those kids are the most important things in, in your lives. And so, you know, look, it just, it, it just took the whole day to find it. It had to do it, yeah. We, we were not supposed to shoot in the kitchen, actually. It was the only place in the house that wasn't designed. <laughs> you know, it wasn't period correct, but it didn't matter. That's where the actors went. This is what felt the most natural. We didn't even have props set for the kitchen. 
well, I had to pull from, you know, the, 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 the crafty truck to get peanut butter sandwiches for ingenue. You know, the only thing in the fridge was orange juice. I mean, Will's just looking for glasses. He's just like finding something. I didn't know what was in the cabinets. I got so I got to stop you for a second because I think this is such a great lesson. Is that everyone thinks that you're like you're working on a Will Smith, HBO, Warner Brothers project, millions of dollars, everything is like perfectly set up. No, things go wrong on these. It goes, it's just the nature of the process. No matter if you've got five hundred million dollars or if you got five dollars, the nature of the process is going to be this. And I love that you're able to say like. I was just going to craft you guys to grab some stuff. Like, yeah. Well, it was great. I think the, the the two things I'm most proud of that scene on top of the performances, right? Will and Anjanu are incredible in the scenes, but we, we it's subtle. But we have a cutaway of the kids. Yeah. And that was not scripted. You know, we 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 have the kids listening, and and it was a, a shot that we stole. But I think it it allowed us to 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 obviously work with different takes. It allowed us an opportunity to see that the kids were involved, that were they were in the house. Um, that were engaged. And I, it was, it was in part, you know, something that we stole on the day, which I think was, was, was really, really helpful for us, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of that. And then I think allowing the actors to be free in that space, to use the kitchen, even though it wasn't designed. And I think it, in a more rigid scenario, you, you, sh- oh, we have to be here. And I think allowing that fluidity to happen, allowing them to find it, allowing them to look, Patrick Mahomes has an offensive play. And then what makes him dynamic is that when he's about to get sacked, he then he turns it into a 20 yard game. And that's what that play kind of felt like. OK, we set them up with a good play call, but it, the play didn't quite go right. And the actors were able to adjust, make adjustments in real time and, and make a play. And that's kind of what it felt like. And together, we created what you see on the screen. The words were always there, right. but how do we create those words? And I think it was a, it was a you know, look, it was a collection of, of, of ideas that, that made their way into that scene. Right. Thankfully, the writer wrote the words for us to play with. And Aura's scene, the real mom, the, the story that, that Anjanu tells there is almost word for word from a conversation I had with the, that the writer and I had with the real mom. And so we heard those words. It's verbatim out of her mouth. And for, for Anjanu to, to perform it the way the way that she did uh, was remarkable. Will is fantastic in that film and in, in that scene. And it's and it's a one two punch. They go straight from there and then Will goes to the court and then hits you with another dagger. So, yeah, it, oh, yeah. it, it really sets up that scene on the court in, in a tremendous way. Um, but, yeah, that, that was the toughest scene for me, for sure, in, in the whole film. Now you've worked with some amazing actors in your in your career so far. I mean, Will is you know a legend and arguably one of the most famous people on the planet, um, and he's done so much in his career. Was there a lesson that you took away from working with a, a you know an artist of that caliber? Oh my God, yeah, just the just the the sheer preparation. You know, it's it's not. There's look, I think Will has afforded himself the opportunity to work on what he wants to work sure, on sure. Uh, when he wants to work on it. And that amount of power and leverage gives you time. If, if, if the world slowed down a little bit for you, imagine what you can accomplish. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's what it felt like working on a film with Will because everyone else is in two minute offense all the time. And he's not. Will's not in two minute offense. Will is in a, a, is is playing a different game, and every film I've ever made felt like I was in two minute offense the whole time. Oh, and it's a different strategy when you're in two minutes, mm-hmm. you, which is good because when you are in two minutes, you have those skills, right? You can you, you can get out of the pocket, you can scramble, you can make things happen, you can see the play very quickly. But when you have time to slow it down. When you have time to be methodical, when you have time to be strategic, you can craft craft moments. And I think that's what the film allowed us to do. By, by virtue of working with Will, I was able to have time to craft, not just make a play, but to craft a play, to design a play, to design a moment of Ingenue going across the street, yeah. to put Will in the tunnels versus having him sit in the stands for the whole game to allow, you know, to move the scene 
of, you know, for Will and, and, and Sanaya to be on the court as opposed to a bedroom. And I think had we not had the time, it would, I just wouldn't have been able to do those things. And I, and I think that's what you get with Will. You get time. The, the world slows down just a little bit in, a, in order for you to, to make more informed decisions. And it's the luxury of time, you know, which we rarely have in this business or industry. And look, we were still running, but I was just running. A li- and, and it felt like I could just see the the field of play a lot better. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I, get, I get you. Look, I've had that opportunity to do it when it's my money and like, oh, it's like I have three actors and yeah, we'll shoot for 10 hours today and maybe we'll go off and shoot 10 hours tomorrow and there's nobody on top of us because we're doing it at such a low budget that we're just having fun and exploring and things like that. So I remember those and then I remember having to shoot 96 pages in four days on a TV show. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get that. And it's a, and, but you need both skill sets. You d- definitely need that. You need that two-minute offense if we're going to use the f- sports analogy. You need that two-minute well, offense. I got the two-minute. Like you, you, there's nobody you want more with – like put me in Patrick Mahomes with 13 seconds. <laughs> I'm going to score. Like, you don't want me with the ball with 13 seconds. At the very least, I'm going to I'm gonna make the pass. I want the ball sure. with no time left on the clock. There's Absolutely. some people that don't want the ball. They want to pass. Yeah. And I've always been the guy to give me the ball. Look, if it falls on me, at least I'm going to take the shot. And that's just always been my mentality. And and look, it served me well so far. I'm just going to keep going with it. Now, what advice would you have for a filmmaker, man, who wants to get into the business today? Uh, you know, there's got to be a reason f- for it, right? Like, what is it that's driving you to do this thing? Um, mm-hmm. You know, for me, it was I just wanted to tell stories. I didn't, again, I didn't care whether I was the, the lineman, the running back, <laughs> the wide receiver, or the quarterback. To me, I just wanted to be part of telling stories and you know of a winning team so to speak that's that's it i was motivated by sportsmanship motivated by being part of a team collaboration and right around my position mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so i think anybody that's exploring the idea of becoming a filmmaker you know just be flexible in finding what position you're going to play and then once you find that position which could be wide receiver put everything into that position because ultimately there's a certain level of skill that you need and then you need the ability and belief that you can make it at that level. And that's it. It's finding your voice on that team, finding your voice in that space. And whether that's a writer, a producer, a director, both, of course, in the beginning, you're doing all of it, right? right. You're, you're doing all three. I'm still doing all three, but truly you're, you're, the more you can focus your in, in terms of percentages. Mm-hmm. If I'm directing 80% of the time versus 60, I'm going to be a much better director. If I'm if I'm only directing 30% and the rest of my time is producing, y- you can see where the math is. It's trying to invest in yourself in 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 those places. And look, as you know, as a person of color, our stories are not being told by us. Mm-hmm. And so we have to tell our own stories. So if we can write them, they they have a chance to be made. You're no right. No one else wrote them for us. Right. So I would just say start with that. Start within. Start writing the stories that that haven't been told from perspectives that we haven't seen them before and trying to find that niche. If you were going to start any business, you would try to put your twist on that business. How, what makes it you? What what makes what's going to make you profitable? You know, like, it's like if you're gonna open up a cookie business, you're gonna put pot in it, and there you go. <laughs> whatever's gonna work for you, whatever exactly. the name, the brand, and that's all you're building. Yeah. You're building a little bit of a brand. You're building your your resume. You're building your voice. All those things. So look, start small. Yeah, man. Think big, and um, the sky's the limit. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? To say no. I'm, you know, I'm 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 genuinely like a wake up on the right side of the bed kind of person. I'm genuinely like a, a, a pretty nice dude. And I have a hard time saying Same. no. I have mm-hmm. a hard time because I, I don't, I, I have, you know, why not? Like I'm a dude from the hood. Like all I wanted was five seconds from some, for somebody. Just give me five minutes, bro. Just give me five minutes. Let me talk to you. Like that was me. I was on that hustle. So I understand that. And, and so I always try to make time for people because I was that person. 
And so, you know, but but it is it's hard when you stretch yourself thin. You can't say yes all the time. Mm, it, no, man. it becomes I challenging. I know it the becomes feeling. challenging and and uh you know, you you have the best intentions, but you you end up making nobody happy, you know. Mm. Um, and so I've been I've been learning to say no a little bit more um, graciously, as as graciously as I can be uh, about saying no. But I think people appreciate no too. People appreciate a hard no. Look, mm -hmm. rather than wasting my time and telling me you could do it and you can't, just say no, man. Fair it's enough. All right. Fair okay. enough. And just I've given myself the ability to say no. And it's 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 afforded me more time um, to, to focus on the things that are most important. And last question, sir. Three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, I got weird films, man. Like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You know, yep. what I'm like good. Like, That's like, a good one. Like, strange films. You know, look, do the right thing is a staple uh, for me for sure. Boys in the Hood is a staple. Oh, so uh, good for me for sure. You know. Um, you know, look, I don't know. Godfather one, Scarface. I, the, the, the list goes on. It's so hard, man. It, it's, it's, it depends on my mood. I could watch Goodwill Hunting at, at any time, sure, any place, on any plane. It's not your fault. So, I, to me, I, I don't know. There's moments in films. You know, there's moments in film. There's scenes in films. You know, Rudy, Rocky. You know, there are just certain oh, yeah. films that 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 have left lasting impressions on on my life. Is there a guilty Rudy. pleasure? Is there a guilty pleasure in film? A guilty pleasure. Like if you would like, you're like Good Burger. Yeah, like wh which one? Like Good Burger. <laughs> Good Burger. <laughs> you know, like That's I awesome. love that little movie. That's you know, awesome. You put Good Burger on. No, it's like a, a Good Burger. I yeah, was talking. I watch Good Burger all day. I, I was I love that. I love, I love, I love all Burger. those movies. You know. Dude, I saw, I was talking to a filmmaker the other day. I'm like, you know, off air. I'm like, man, did you ever see Last Dragon? He goes, dude, I love Last Dragon. That is the best. That's the look, best. Look, look <laughs> show I enough. Cobra, right? I have no issues. I Cobra watch Khan. every survivalist show alone. <laughs> and if, if I have to light a fire, you're ready to I go. I know I'm doing it from my, my TV. We didn't, we grew up black. We weren't allowed to go outside and do sleepovers. <laughs> We weren't allowed to be in the wilderness. That that was not us. So, so <laughs> certainly, certainly, like love watching people in like crazy places <laughs> that you will never we were never allowed to do. <laughs> I can't even put a tent together. No, no, not. <laughs> when my son bought a tent, I was like, I yeah, I don't know. Is, do it, I, is there, I, you know, is there a YouTube? <laughs> is, there, is there like a, an app for this? Which I'm sure there is. You know. <laughs> But, Brother, no, man, no, listen, I, man. I, I'm it is... best, but, 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 yeah. No, I, I have plenty of guilty pleasures. I love all movies, all sizes, all shapes. Um, you know, I think art can come from so many different ways, man. I'm, I love comedies. I, I love to laugh. I love, I love to just suspend my disbelief and and, and go somewhere else. And and that's what movies can do for you, brother, man. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Uh, continue success, man. I, I really am looking forward to seeing the other stories that you're going to tell in the future, man. So I appreciate you being on the show and thank you for making a great movie. And uh, I wish you nothing but continued success, brother. Oh man. I appreciate you. Thank you very much.